Los Angeles. What is up and welcome to the LA Football Show here on the LA Football Network. I'm your co-host Ryan Dyer, joined as always by the madman Jamal Madney. This is your Chargers edition of the show. What up, Bolt fam? Excited to talk some Chargers football. OTAs have kicked off this past week. We're going to hold that talk for maybe next week as we can dissect some of it and get more into it later. And, you know, everyone else is talking OTAs. So we're going to have some more fun this episode and do something a little different before I get into what we're doing. My man, Jamal, what's up, brother? How we doing? Doing well, right? Excited to get into it here. It's always fun when you come up with these clever concepts. And so as an NBA guy myself, this NBA NFL crossover for this show, I'm really excited about. Exactly. So in honor of the NBA finals beginning here in just a few days, we are going to choose five Chargers players and create comparisons for who they might compare to uh, in the NBA as NBA players. Um, So it should be fun, you know, we're in the, the offseason here. Let's have some fun with it and not do the same old, same old talk that everyone else is doing. Um, hit us up on Twitter. Let us know your thoughts. Let us know who you would compare these players to. At LAFB Jams is Jamal. At Ryan Dyrud, LAFB is myself. Or you can text us, text the word BOLTS to 31032, and you can let us know there. Show is always brought to you by our friends at BetOnline. Head to BetOnline.ag today. Use our promo code BELIEVE, that's B-L-E-A-V, gets you a... welcome bonus on your first deposit. Tell them the guys at the LA football network sent you. So Jamal, uh, first off, how are you doing? How's the day treating you? How's the week treating you? You know, I'm, I'm in my little phone booth here recording. It's getting hot in here. I'm getting warm, but, uh, but things are going well. I can't complain. How are you doing? Doing well, right. Excited to, you know, sort of be midway through the week here and, and beyond. And, uh, you know, it was fun. I, I got an opportunity to go to the Laker game Monday night and against your beloved Nuggets. And uh, what a great game that was. Obviously disappointed as a Laker fan, but man, the Nuggets are a great team and certainly the better team. And we could be on the cusp of a of a mini run here where I, I could see the Nuggets win more than one championship over the next three or four years. And Jokic and Murray sort of remind me of, you know, Shaq and Kobe a little bit. You know, there's, Mm -hmm. you know, it's not quite that dominant. It's not quite that electric, but kind of the big and the little together. There's definitely shades of that. So um, we could be on the cusp of a a new team, a new sort of iconic team in the NBA. So uh, always excited about that. Yeah, you know, it's it's obviously I'm a Nuggets fan. Um, but I think what's, what's impressive about where they are now is, is two things. A, you know, their coach, Michael Malone is in year eight and we see in the NBA the the quick trigger on firing head coaches when it doesn't work right away. Um, and they, they stuck with Michael Malone, even through those eight years, I think they're on their third GM, not due to firings, but by GMs getting poached to other teams, um, losing GMs to, uh, you know, just Conley last year, I believe went to Minnesota, um, right. So they're on another GM that's going into this year. And so able to keep still the the fortitude and kind of the band together, even with changes up at the top. And then obviously they added players in, in free agency and whatnot, but their their true core, you know, is homegrown for the draft in in Joker and in Jamal Murray. And so it's, it's rare nowadays in the NBA. I didn't even say rare. I think it's outside of like the Bucks, maybe or the other team that did that just with Giannis, they wouldn't have got other guys as well, but it's just so rare nowadays to see a, a quote unquote super team built through the draft. And then obviously add some role players around him. So um, yeah, it's, it's, it's been exciting to be a Denver fan and, and see them, you know, uh, make it back to, or not make it back, make it for the first time. And, and Hey, old owner, Stan Kroenke going for championship number four in a, in a calendar year, basically, uh, which is insane. So his, his stock is keeps rising. For sure, right. I mean, Kroenke's the 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 key piece here. I mean, who whatever he touches is gold. Uh, it's it's unbelievable, and you know, kudos to him for having that business sense and just the eye for for being on the cusp of greatness. Yeah, exactly. So, well, Chargers comps. This should be fun. Um, Chargers were hard because there's there's so many big name players to choose from. You know, we did the Rams segment earlier, and it's you got your big three, and outside of that, you're kind of like. All right, who do we want to talk about and compare to NBA players with the Chargers? You could you could pull ten guys if you want to and and have some some decent comps. So um, we'll go one by one. Obviously, we're starting with Justin Herbert, the face of the team. Um, you know, could become the face of of LA football if uh, if decided you know to kind of 
take on that on his shoulders, if you will. I'm really curious to see who you have comped him. Uh, I wouldn't be shocked if we had the same guy and it may make people unhappy. I don't know. We'll see. I'll start with you. Who do you got comp to, to Justin Herbert? Yeah, Ryan. I mean, this could be kind of a, a bit of an explosive conversation here, but I think that when you think about Herbert, you, you think about not just a, a future face of LA football, you just think a future face of the NFL and he, he's got that ability. And is he going to be kind of that next face potentially right there with, with Mahomes and Burrow and, and be really a co-face of the league. And I think the other piece that you think of is just supreme physical ability and just his ability to, to throw the ball and just the rocket for the arm and the velocity um, that he can generate on his ball and, and just, you know, where he can sort of find guys from different arm angles and positions is, is close to unparalleled in today's game. And so when you think about an NBA comp, when you think about a guy who can just rocket it with an arm, you think about a guy in the NBA who can just sort of jump through the gym and can just do all kinds of, very unique things with athleticism and another guy who's sort of potentially the face of the league. And I actually, my comp for him is John Morant. And, Mm -hmm. you know, the, now the, the challenge, of course, the, especially with what has come out the last couple of days and the last couple of weeks, by no means are we saying that Herbert and Morant are sort of similar in terms of, you know, their approach to (laughs) personality and their approach to off the field, off the court types of things. But, I think the similarity is there where Morant has some growing that he needs to do uh, for different reasons if he truly wants to be a face of the league and really sort of propel himself as, as one of the co-faces of the 2020s in the NBA. And I think for Herbert, he also needs some maturing to do more as a leader in the locker room, more as being more of an outward personality if he wants to be a co-face of the NFL in the 2020s. So when I think of John Morant and I think of Justin Herbert, I actually see tremendous parallels there. Guys on the cusp of greatness, guys with just supreme athleticism that's sort of unparalleled, and both guys that need to kind of go on a journey of self-discovery here to really reach their leadership potential. Yeah, I mean, it makes sense. Uh, of course, keeping it strictly to to the sport they play, um, I, I could definitely see the similarities. You know, Ja, I think again, take all the outside noise out is a, is a top 10 player. Uh, but is he going to make that next step up? Which we talk about Herbert all the time, like all the talent, will he make that next step? Now I, I took a similar approach in it. Um, now I, I, my comp I chose has a lot more um, accomplishments to his career so far. So I, I'll need to explain a little better, um, but I went with Kevin Durant. And mm. the reason why I comp wow. that is when you look at Justin Herbert, Everyone out there knows the talent's there. Arguably the best arm in football. The size is there. The the ability to just how pretty it looks when he throws the ball through the air. The the pinpoint accuracy, the all of it. We can go down the list. But is has he gotten that level yet where he can carry the team on his own and change the game and make the players around him better? And when you look at Kevin Durant, even to this day in his career, top five top two score in the NBA right now, probably can jump to the gym. It's just so pretty the way he shoots. He can take over games here and there, but have we seen enough to say through his career, he'll go down as one of the greatest or has he relied on other talent around him to carry him the extra step, right? Like the days in Oklahoma city couldn't quite get over the hump goes to golden state with the help of Steph and clay and Draymond. Well, then he gets his ring. Does he need a super team around him or is he, the one of the greatest that can carry it on his own, right? Justin Herbert, we say all the time, like he has the talent of of a of a Brady, of a Burrow, of all these guys, but is he quite there yet, or does he just need more pieces around him to get him over the edge? And so that's kind of where I went with the comp of the talent's all there, but can you do it on your own, or do you need the players around you to, to elevate you instead of you elevating them? Which I think, as great as KD's been throughout his career, that's still the ongoing conversation: is does he elevate? Or is he just a pure scorer that needs other guys to elevate him further? And we'll see if Herbert can make that leap here, you know, in year four. Yeah, it's interesting, Ryan. I mean, it's 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 an intriguing comp. And obviously, they're at very different stages in their career. Durant at the tail end, Herbert just at the beginning. Obviously, Durant, you know, still an MVP, multiple-time champion. But I think it's a, it's a valid point where I think I think Kevin Durant is a potential outcome 
of Justin Herbert's career, you know, that could be one path where if he can't quite sort of be, be a franchise guy that you can build around, but he needs sort of this stacked team, an outcome could be Kevin Durant. Or he's more an outcome of, of other great players that you could build around, like a LeBron, like a Kobe, like a, a Patrick Mahomes. So it's interesting. I think the time mm-hmm. phasing is very different here, but I think the point is is very valid. Yeah, so we'll see. I, mean, I might be stretching on that one, but I think it was more looking at talent versus Absolutely. Um, outcome, as you said. So, all right, player number two. And, you know, we were going back and forth on which receiver to use because obviously there's a, it's a talented room. But we, went, we had to go with the stalwart veteran, old Keenan Allen, um, who's had such a good career with the LA Chargers. And uh, hopefully we'll have many more to come. We'll see as that room is getting deeper and maybe they'll, they'll move on. But at this point, he's, he's wide receiver one on this team. So, Jamal, who is your comp for Keenan Allen? Yeah, this is interesting, Ryan. I mean, for, for Keenan Allen, I think when I think about him, I think of a guy with tremendous skill, uh, tremendous production. Um, but yet there have been questions about him truly being a wide receiver, number one, primarily because of health, primarily because of just being available on the field. Um, and so there's always kind of this doubt where, look, if we get the best of Keenan Allen, we're talking about, you know, a, a top seven, eight, ten receiver in the game. But, you know, how often it, it, from an availability standpoint do we get him to be able to make that production? And I think a very interesting sort of synergy and and metaphor is taking place in the NBA right now, and that is Jamal Murray. And, you know, I think Jamal Murray is a guy who we we have never really questioned his ability, whether it was back in Kentucky early in his Denver career, and then Bubble Murray was absolutely fantastic. So he's proven the production on the field much in the same way as Keenan Allen did, but both have had to sort of fight through injuries in the last two years the reason we haven't seen Denver this deep in the playoffs from 2020 onwards is really because Jamal Murray's been hurt. Now that Jamal Murray is playing and healthy, we're seeing what he's capable of. So I think that if we can put a whole season together with Keenan Allen where he's really healthy, I think the conversation of him right in that upper echelon of receivers is going to be right there, given his supreme skill, his creativity, and just his ability to get open and catch the ball much in the same way Jamal Murray, just off the bounce, his shot, his ability to get into the mid-range, his ability to sort of have those incredible fadeaways. I mean, is just really top-notch, top-tier, absolutely elite. So to me, Keenan Allen is very much like Jamal Murray. You know, Jamal, I knew eventually through this list we'd have the same comp, and this is the one. Yep. I had Jamal, yep. I had Jamal yep. Murray as well. Um, for everything you said, and, and just to kind of double-click on it, you know, Going into these NBA playoffs with the Nuggets, they were the one seed. They were the best regular season team in basketball. But the big question surrounding them was everyone knew Joker would be great, but what are we going to get from Jamal Murray? Are we going to get bubble Murray? Are we going to get an inconsistent Jamal Murray that we've kind of seen throughout his career? And, and that's kind of the same when you look at Keenan Allen with how great as he's been, you know, every year he's that fringe top 10 receiver, but the big knock against him is, um, and I wouldn't even say pure injury, but it's it's just the little nagging banged upness. Like outside of last year, he was fairly healthy the three years prior, but he'd come off plays here and there. He'd he'd miss a game here and there, not a full season, but it was just could never get in that true consistent rhythm of day in and day out, putting up the 100, 110 yard receiving, the eight to 10 catches, the one touchdown a game. And we've seen the kind of the same with Jamal Murray. Whereas if you can get that consistency, we know how great they are. We see how great they are. We've seen how great Jamal Murray is. We've seen how great Keenan Allen can be when he's at that true peak condition. So yeah, everything you said, I'll, I'll end it with that. But I think it's it's an easy comp with those two. Yeah, no, we finally Ryan, had I, one I, the same. We finally had one the same. And I think you hit the nail on the head with the consistency. That's kind of been also the knock with Murray when he was healthy. It's like, well, one night he's going to go for 30. The next night he's going to go for six. And same thing Mm -hmm. with Keenan Allen, because maybe he's a little bit banged up or maybe because he's a little bit not quite as engaged week over week. One night he's going to go one week. He's going to go 120 yards on eight catches and a touchdown. Next night you see him, you know, it's four for 38. And so, you know, if they if they can just sort of tighten it up and from a consistency standpoint where if uh, Jamal Murray can get you 25 to 30 a night, you know, he doesn't have to go for 40 one night and then 10 the next night. But if he can stay within 25 to 30 you're going to see an absolutely elite talent flourish. And I think the same thing with Keenan Allen. 
He doesn't need to give you 120 yards a night, but even if he can stay within that 75 to 110 range every game, you're going to see a really elite talent emerge. And so I just love that comp. They're just so connected um, in terms of their story and their ability. Yeah, absolutely. So well done, sir. That's our best comp of the day since we uh, we were on, on and on the same. So, all right, moving down the list. Um, we haven't talked about this, so I mean, maybe we we maybe have a little blurb about it real quickly. But Austin Eckler, that's who we're going to do, running back for the Chargers. Officially, just on Tuesday, I believe, Chargers agreed to add two million dollars worth of incentives to this year's uh, uh, contract. Uh, so at, at least at this moment, Eckler should be reporting back. Will be whether it's at mini camp or whether it's at training camp, he'll be back on the field for the bolts and seemingly will at least be happy for this season as he can earn up to just, I think over 8 million for this year. Um, so let me just ask you really quick. I mean, are we glad we can put this to bed now that like, we all knew he was going to be in a bolt uniform, or at least we all meaning me and you, um, we knew no one was going to trade for him. That's just the running back market. Unfortunately, he wasn't going to get the demands he wanted, unfortunately, whether you like it or not. So we all knew this was going to be in, but Hey, he gets a little extra cash. He's back. He can be happy. You know, I think this kind of worked out best for both parties. Yeah, Ryan, I think this is the best possible outcome that could have taken place for both Eckler as well as the team. I'll say for Eckler more so. I think that he he sort of finally came to the realization that given his age, given his position in terms of the league, you know, there's just there just isn't a market there. And so I think he shopped around. And I think the Chargers did right by him to say, look, we're not going to give you any more guaranteed money. But what we are going to do is we're really going to create an incentive laden structure here where you reach a certain number of games, a certain number of receiving yards, a certain number of receiving uh, touchdowns, rushing yards, rushing touchdowns. You know, this thing is going to build up in excess of potentially $2 million if you hit everything, which is a win win scenario. Because if you get that level of production out of Eckler, you should be in a really good spot if you're the Chargers in terms of this season and that $2 million will be well spent. So I think this is exactly how it, it, you know, sort of needed to shake out. And I think both sides can now put this behind him and feel good about it. Eckler, I think, has an opportunity for some upside. And the Chargers also feel like they didn't sort of erode that relationship that really meant to them. They handled it really well as a franchise. And also they, they kind of created an aligned incentive structure that really made sense. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Totally agree. So, um, all right, well, looking at comps now for Austin Eckler, um, you know, great running back, very versatile, really curious to see who your NBA comp is for him. Yeah, you know, with, with Eckler, Ryan, you know, he's a guy who's super versatile, obviously, the the rushing ability, the the receiving ability, the blocking ability, he's an absolute stat stuffer in terms of output and productivity, but he's also in an environment where his position is becoming obsolete. And, you know, sort of his style of game, you know, the sort of the dink and dunk for for four or five, six yards, you know, off the, you know, on the fringe in terms of the outside, very close to the line of scrimmage. I don't know how much of you can do that consistently and still feel like, you know, you're a contender. So he's a stat stuffer. But what is his impact really on winning and what is his sort of level of obsolescence given the where the game is going? And to me, the absolute comp of that is Russell Westbrook. When you when you look at Westbrook being obviously triple double king, we talk about triple double king. No one is the triple double king quite like Russell Westbrook. Five years of averaging a triple double. No one questions the productivity, the output, the heart, the commitment. But when you look at where the modern NBA game is going in terms of pace, in terms of space, in terms of shooting, you know, those are areas where Russell Westbrook really struggles in terms of valuing the ball, turnovers are high, and then obviously shooting the basketball. And so when you think about Eckler and the role of a running back and a role of a guy kind of catching short passes out of the backfield in a modern NFL that is more predicated on spreading it out, really interchanging your skill players to stay fresh all the time, almost like having kind of hockey line changes, you know, he's had this great output and productivity but where is his place in the game moving forward? And I think the similar question that you have about Austin Eckler in the NFL, very similar question you have about Russell Westbrook in the NBA. Yeah, I, I definitely can see that comp and, and you know, the versatility and, and what they both bring and, and stuff makes a lot of sense. For me, you know, I, I love Austin Eckler. I, I love his story, obviously. I love that he's going to be for a happy Charger again this year. And I think he brings so much to this offense, especially, you know, with what Kellen Moore is going to bring in, in terms of play calling and play design. 
Um, but, but the direction I went is I looked at, I looked at efficiency. Like if you look at Eckler's stats throughout the year, they look very good. Obviously great number of touchdowns, um, the yards in terms of rushing and receiving look very good. But when you look at how he got there, how efficient was it, right? Like the, the yards per carry were pretty low, only two games over a hundred yards rushing the other 15, all under most of those even sub 60 yards rushing. And so when I look at a player that looks explosive, is explosive, is a very good player. So I'm not saying Eckler's a bad player. This is a good NBA player. And when you look at the stat sheet in terms of ending output versus efficiency, I look at a guy like Trey Young, point guard for the Atlanta mm. Hawks, uh, a very explosive player, um, a great young player in this game, you know, is shooting what sub 40%, you know, every given night to get to that point total, he's got to put up a lot of shots to get there. He can go very cold at times and, and shoot you out of games. If you will not saying Eckler costs you games by any means, but there's certain times when the efficiency just isn't quite there without the proper blocking or play design to get him what he needs uh, in order to get those ending result totals. So, um, it's going to sound like a knock of a, of a comparison. Trey young is a great young player in the NBA. So I don't want it to be like that, but I mean, just look at just efficiency of how you get to where you are. That's the kind of comp I see. Yeah. Right. I mean, it's such a great point. And, and frankly, the efficiency piece is why I even love my Westbrook comp even more because yeah. for all the reasons that you talked about Trey young, you know, that's been the knock on Westbrook is, you know, yep. his, his stats are a product more of his usage rate than they are of him sort of maximizing every possession. And that's really the case with Eckler. It's, it's, it's a pure volume usage rate situation. When you look at Westbrook in terms of his field goal percentage, his free throw percentage, his three-point percentage, all at the real, the near bottom of the league in that regard, and very similar to Austin Eckler in terms of starting running back productivity on a per play basis, yards per carry basis, are actually in the bottom of the league from an NFL standpoint. So that's really why I, I really kind of like that Eckler Westbrook comparison. Again, you can't question those guys' output and their productivity and obviously what they've done for their teams and what they've done for the game. But as the game is moving forward, feels like those guys are getting left behind a little bit. And that's why I really like the Trey Young comparison. Now Young is young enough where I think that he still can grow in the right situation. Sometimes I think in Trey Young's case, some of the bad habits come from just not having enough structure and accountability around him. And I think if Trey Young went to a more winning culture, a more winning situation, I think he would hone into the right player. But I love the argument and I see the points. Yeah. Yeah. In terms of efficiency, I wrestle Westbrook is, is the better comp in that. So that, absolutely there. Um, all right. Moving to the defense now for the Chargers and a lot of great players to choose from on defense that we could have fun with. Um, you can tell how hot it is in here. My face is like bright red. <laughs> I need to just take my, take my sweater off. Um, but we're going to go with Joey Bosa, the big bear on the defensive line, hoping for a big comeback season this year after being riddled with injuries last year and, and just, you know, not having the same production that he expects fans expects the team expects even over the last couple of years. So who's your comp for Joey Bosa? So, Rai, I mean, for me, you know, when I think of Bosa and I think of, you know, big physical specimen, you know, pass rush guy, I also think of a center. I think of, you know, a guy who's, who's sort of very dominant on that line and, and someone that we haven't quite gotten everything out of just yet. And it's, it's a reason for injuries. It's been nagging injuries over his career, consistency, engagement, uh, body language sometimes. So all the talent and all the tools are there. And how does he sort of put it all together? And I think the comp is the guy who this year was finally able to kind of put all those things together, stay on the court and really put a whole body of work together. And that's Joel Embiid. When you mm -hmm. think about Embiid and everything that he brings to the table in terms of versatility as a big, he can score, he can defend, he can rebound, he can block shots, he can hit you with the three ball, he can post you up, he can face you up and take you to the cup. Same thing with Bosa. When you think about him as a pass rusher, you know, outside, inside, he's got the feet, he's got the combinational moves as a big, just is a matchup nightmare for any offensive lineman, just in the way Joel Embiid is a matchup nightmare for any big in the NBA. And the first couple of years of Embiid's career, obviously he couldn't really stay on the court, was chronically injured the last couple of years, won the scoring title last year, but still wasn't on the court quite as much. And then this year finally was able to stay on the court long enough 
to be able to put his MVP season together. And I see a similar path here for Joey Bosa, where if he can stay on the field and stay engaged for a full season, you're talking about a guy who can very easily be defensive player of the year and really kind of be the face of his position uh, across the sport in much the way Embiid was this year. Yeah, it's a great comp. Um yeah, I love that comp. Everything you said, it makes total sense. And and I went a a similar direction in terms of um, just the the size, the prowess, the skill set. And I didn't my my kind of comp for this is based on where this NBA player currently is and where Joey Bosa is going. So Bosa's mm. career has been much more storied and accomplished than this NBA players. But in terms of of hype and skill set, they're kind of both in that same regard of where they need to get to. And that's why I chose Zion Williamson, uh, mm. a guy who freak athlete, obviously a, a top prospect coming into the league and very similar to everything you said about MB just hasn't been able to put it all together. Just hasn't been able to stay healthy this year was on kind of an MVP campaign and then gets hampered with injuries yet again. So Bose is kind of in that same spot where we've seen how great he can be, but now we haven't seen it for two or so years. And so will he get back to that? Will he ever reach that level that is expected of him again? Will Zion Williams have ever reached that level ever that we expect him to get to that he hasn't been able to do yet in the NBA? So uh, very similar reasoning, Embiid and Williamson, um, just different players, but obviously freak athletes, physical specimens, both of the, all three of them. And uh, I think they make a lot of sense in regard of where they need to do this season to kind of silence the critics, if you will. No, I love that, Ryan. That that's a that's a spot on one there with Zion. And, you know, obviously I think Embiid is further along in his career. If you look at Embiid's career the first two or three years, very similar to the Zion yeah. uh, career the first two years, where when you look at things like plus minus, you're like, My God, when this guy's on the court, you know, the team that he's on is a championship contender. It's just a matter of figuring out how to keep him on the on the court. And I think it's a similar story here with Bosa. So I absolutely love that. And you can just see it. You can see it in flashes where this is a potential face of the league, this is a potential MVP, if you know you can just put the reps together. So let's hope, knock on wood, that Bosa can use 2023 as kind of that first year of putting it together. Yeah, definitely. Uh, the Chargers need it. Um, and so, you know, he obviously wants it as for career. And if we talked before, Jamal, if if we can get a, you know, Bosa and Mac as as top 15 edge rushers, this defense is going to is going to be very, very frightening because um, they'll get production from other positions as well. But if those two can really hone in and be, you know, top 15 and it's going to start with Bosa being in that top eight, probably. Um, so we'll see. Uh, but both good comps there. So, you know, there's players out there that, you know, can you imagine if he went by Joe Bosa? It just doesn't sound right. It's got to be Joe. No, it doesn't. No, no, sir. No way. Yeah, you yeah. know, it's I Joey. Have a, I have a buddy from high school. Um Billy Boynton is his name, but now that he's older, he just goes by Bill. But I, I'm like the only one in his life, I think, that still calls him Billy. Because I'm like, Billy Boynton, that's who you are. Like, you're not Bill Boynton. That just doesn't sound right to me. So it's always funny when I go back home and everyone calls him Bill. I'm like, who the hell is Bill? I'm like, oh, like, <laughs> Billy? Okay. I'd be like, J who's Joe? Who's Joe Bosa? That sounds like a, a car insurance salesman or something. Like Joey Bosa. Now that's a, that's a top five edge rusher in the NFL. All right. Final player here. And really excited to see who you got here, Jamal, because this can go so many different ways. Derwin James, uh, the great defensive back on the back end for your Los Angeles Chargers. Who are you going with, Jamal? So, Ryan, I think, you know, when you think about Derwin James, I think the first word to me that comes to mind is versatility. And, you know, just all the things that you can do with him. You can put him in the box and, you know, he can help with run stuffing. You know, obviously you put him in pass coverage. He's a safety. He can do a little bit of everything. And so I think, you know, he's got kind of that Swiss army knife package that few, if any, have. Now, having said that, you also can't really have Derwin James as being your de facto best player on defense and truly be considered a championship contender. You need somebody, you know, to our earlier points, you need Bosa there on the front line. You need your front seven to be kind of stacked. And so when I think about the NBA and I think about a guy who's just so versatile can really do a little bit of everything and there's really no holes in his game whatsoever but also can't quite sort of be the number one guy on a championship team he needs to be kind of that number two guy I think of a guy just you know down the street from the Rams and I think of Paul George and you know when you think of PG obviously the skill is there offensively he can shoot he can play make he can take it to the cup he can post you up 
you know, one of, if not the best two-way perimeter player in basketball. And that has been the case the last five, six, seven years. So the versatility is off the charts. He can guard your point guard. He can go all the way down and basically guard your power forward. And so when you think about Derwin James and just all of the different places on the field that you can put him, you know, and he's just equally effective regardless of where you put him. And so just, just the versatility of talent and obviously Derwin James an all pro Paul George has been all NBA multiple times. And so again, I think that unique skill set is so valuable, but you know, if we're being completely honest with ourselves, I don't think the chargers are going to get to championship status with Derwin James being their de facto best player on defense. It's going to have to be Bosa truthfully. And then Derwin James sort of supporting on all ends of the field in much the same way for the Clippers, you know, it, Kawhi Leonard is going to have to be the best player. And then Derwin, and then Paul George being number two. We've seen Paul George try to be a one in Indiana. We've seen him try to be a one, even with Westbrook a little bit in OKC. It doesn't quite happen. He's a true number two, maybe the best number two in basketball. And I think Derwin James is probably the best number two defender in all of the NFL. Yeah, this is funny. You know, I, I totally agree. Uh, everything you said, and it, it makes a lot of sense. But this is this will be probably the comp where you're we came to our conclusion the most differently. And um, because my comp is Kawhi Leonard (laughs) and (laughs) not, not, and to, to what you were saying, I, I didn't choose Kawhi because I think Derwin needs to be the best player on the defense. um, Cause I do agree with you. I think in just the NFL in general, your safety can't be your best. You need a, you need an edge rusher as your best. It's just the way the NFL goes. Um, But I, I did it to Kawhi because of how versatile they truly are. Kawhi can kind of do it all. He's a great defender, great shooter. He can drive it to the lane. Um, he can really do everything. Derwin James, same thing. He can play as your star, can play as your money, can play as your safety, can play up against in the box, can can you know be a great run defender, can be a great um, pass defender, can cover speedy receivers, can also cover tight ends. So just their versatility. But then the other reason was when you look at star players in both these leagues, the casual fan – these are two guys that are always forgotten. Kawhi Leonard, mm. as he wants to be, never really at the forefront of, of star players in the NBA. Yes, he had his one championship run with Toronto. Yes, he came to LA, but he's playing for kind of the little brother team in the Clippers. And, you know, he's not, he doesn't get the same recognition as even a, a Dame Lillard or even a, a, a Joker or even some of these other guys. He's kind of always forgotten and everyone brings him up like, oh yeah, forgot. Kawhi Leonard's great. Derwin James kind of the same way. Like when you bring his name up, oh yeah, Derwin James, what a steal for the Chargers at 17. Oh, one of the best safeties in the game. But when you're talking the great safeties are just great defenders, rarely is he ever brought up. Uh, and it could be similar reason playing for the Chargers out here and, and not playing for maybe the, the Rams or one of these other premier teams. So I think when the versatility and then the kind of forgotten stardom that both players possess, that's where I got the comp in terms of, needing to be what you are for your team. I agree with you in the Paul George comp. Funny, we both came up with Clippers as a comp, just very different yeah. reasons and very different players. No, I love I love the narrative thread there, Ryan, and I love the sort of the train of thought. I think the one thing I would argue is the reason Kawhi Leonard is forgotten is because Kawhi Leonard doesn't play anymore. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> you know? yeah. Yeah. Kawhi Leonard plays like seven games a year, yeah. so we sort we of forget about him. Does too sometimes. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, Kawhi Leonard, it feels like he's been load managing now since San Diego State. I mean, it, it's sort of unreal, you know, what, what's been kind of going on on the back end of his career in terms of just, you know, availability game over game. But I agree with you. Sort of the reason aside, yeah, you know, they, they are a little bit forgotten. And then when you bring them up, you're like, of course. And Kawhi Leonard, you know, th- it's an interesting stat in the NBA. There's only three guys in the NBA today that have multiple championships and multiple finals MVPs. And it's LeBron James, Kevin Durant, and Kawhi Leonard. And, and, you know, Kawhi, not just with that, you know, really iconic run with Toronto in 2019 and, and ending the Warriors bid for a three-peat there. But then also everyone forgets in 2014, you know, being on the Spurs and the last of that Spurs dynasty championship team, he was finals MVP. I mean, think about Kawhi is one championship he beats the the Heatles, the Miami Heat big three with LeBron, Wade, and Bosch. And the other title, you know, obviously he beats the the Durant uh, and Steph Warriors. Now, obviously the Warriors were injured, but I mean, you, you want to talk about maybe the two greatest sort of victories in a championship environment against teams that were stacked. I mean, Kawhi Leonard is really at the top of that list and really should be more appreciated 
in much the same way I think Derwin James should be much appreciated uh, in, in yeah. a greater sense. So I totally understand the narrative thread there. Yeah, everyone forgets that that Spurs. I, a lot of people probably forget he was even drafted by the Spurs. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I just think he immediately was on Toronto. Um, as we wrap up, uh, when I was at, and I, I think I've told you this, Jamal, but when I was at Long Beach State going to college and undergrad there, our homecoming game one year was against San Diego State. And so I got to see Kawhi Leonard at the Pyramid in Long Beach before he became, you know, the great Kawhi Leonard two-time NBA champion. So um, kind of cool. I was going to bring up too in our Rams segment, I compared Stafford to Dame Lillard and it was either the year before that or the year after that Long Beach State played Weber State in our homecoming game. So I got to see Dame Lillard at the Pyramid. So got some cool moments at my uh, Long Beach State alum uh, at the Pyramid. So, but yeah, it was That's fun awesome. to see Kawhi back then. That's amazing. I mean, you could go to a, you know, you could go to a Duke or a, a Carolina or or any of these sort of blue blood schools and not see a guy of that ilk uh, in terms of kind of a visiting player, or even a home player. You know, you spend three, four years there. I mean, to, to actually see two guys that are truly, you know, in their heyday, two of the, you know, eight best players in basketball. That's really something. Yeah. Just like how lucky is that? Like we play Weber State and San Diego State and happens to be two of the premier NBA players of their generation uh, playing at Walter Pyramid. So um Fun stuff there, but all right. Well, there you have it. There's the list, the five Chargers players most comparable to the NBA current players. Uh, let us know how we did at LAFB Jams is Jamal on Twitter at Ryan Dyer at LAFB is myself at LAFB Network is the main channel, or you can text us, text Bolts to the number 31032. We'd love to hear from you. Give us some of your thoughts. Give us some of your comps. And, uh, you know, you can let us know about the Ackler news or whatever you want to chat about. So we'd love to hear from you. So that's all the time we got, though. Next week, we'll talk more OTAs and kind of what went down and the, the Herbert uh, Johnston connection, the Kellen Moore effect and all that fun stuff. We'll let it resonate over the weekend and get into it next week. So thank you all for tuning in. For Jamal Madney, I'm Ryan Dyer. Everyone enjoy your weekend. Talk to you all soon.